Hi, everyone. Welcome to our get together on the cerebellum. And um, today we have as our guest, Jennifer Raymond. Jennifer is a Guggenheim professor of neurobiology at Stanford. She received her bachelor's degree in mathematics from uh, Williams College in Massachusetts. Then she went down to Texas, where she did a PhD with Jack Byrne studying learning in the aplysia. And um, she brought with her her mathematical skills, not just doing physiology, but also building mathematical models of cellular plasticity and mechanisms for classical conditioning, studying things like extinction and uh, uh, reinforcement learning and its effects on um, the network. Then she moved again west um, to California to UCSF, where she did a postdoc with Steve Lisberger, studying vestibular ocular reflex and um, discovering um, concepts like eligibility trace and the mechanisms with which the cerebellum um, maintains the uh, effects of uh, the climbing fibers um, as, as a function of the time that has passed since the, the simple spikes. Um, in 1999, she moved down to Stanford where she became an assistant professor. And during this time, she has uh, mentored many outstanding students and people like Ed Boyden and as well as uh, writing fantastic papers on cerebellum and advocating for uh, women in science, particularly writing about gender bias. Um, Jennifer, it's wonderful to have you. Thank you for taking the time. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me. I love this seminar series. If it wasn't like in the middle of my commute, I would come every week, but I have been catching up on a couple of videos. And I made the mistake of messing with this while I while you were introducing me. Uh, so let me see if I can. I have a little thing blocking me from forwarding. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, sorry guys for the technical difficulty. Let me put this up here. That looks better for me, I hope. Does that look good for you guys? Yes, it looks great. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm delighted to share some recent work, um, not yet, but hopefully almost published, uh, soon to be published work on metaplasticity in the cerebellum. And um, this will be two different projects. The first one led by Amin Shakawat, who's a senior postdoc in the lab, and the second led by Sriram Jayabal. And um, in both cases, we didn't really set out to look for metaplasticity, but just kind of stumbled into this interesting and actually kind of sparsely studied area of neuroscience um, as we tried to ask a different question, which is the one that has driven me since I was a graduate student working on aplysia learning. And that's this question of what is the algorithm a neural circuit uses to implement learning? What are the rules that determine which synapses change in response to a given experience? And um, you know, how, what is the logic that determines whether you tweak, uh, let me put on a pointer, you know, what is the logic that determines if you need to change your output to an input, when do you tweak the synapse versus that synapse? And I'd argue that there's no circuit in the mammalian brain for which we really understand learning at this algorithmic level. Um, so my strategy has been to choose a circuit uh, that has a relatively simple circuit architecture that makes analysis of this question easier. And of course, that is the wonderful cerebellum, which has just five main types of neurons in the cerebellar cortex, plus a couple of others um, that are smaller in number. And um, as many of you know, there's been like a surge of interest in the cerebellum recently and uh, that interest like throughout neuroscience kind of interest and that's come in great part from the wonderful work that's going on showing increasing evidence for a role of the cerebellum in all kinds of functions uh, that were previously ascribed solely to the forebrain uh, things like navigation and attention and um, planning um, fear um, so and and social behavior, so um, you know, lots of complex behaviors um, and very cognitive behaviors now ascribed to the cerebellum. Um, so I'm a big fan of that work, um, but that's not what we do in my lab to get at this question. Um, we've sort of chosen the some of the very simplest forms of learning that are implemented by the cerebellum. 
we study how we study ocular motor learning. So that's how visual and vestibular inputs drive eye movements, um, how the cerebellum contributes to the commands for eye movements, and how uh, cerebellum dependent learning can alter the eye movement response to a sensory input, a visual or vestibular input. And then we leverage the simplicity of the circuit and the behavioral system to try to connect the dots between what's happening at the synaptic level, at the circuit level, and at the behavioral level during learning. Um, and today, uh, and you know, I'll tell about how in trying to connect the dots, we stumbled upon evidence for two kinds of metaplasticity at the cerebellar synapses. Um, first, I'll talk uh, in the first part, I'll talk about threshold metaplasticity. So experience dependent changes in how um, hard or easy it is to induce plasticity. And um, in the second part, I'll talk about plasticity of the timing rules for plasticity. So changes in uh, threshold and timing requirements for inducing associative plasticity in learning. And in both cases, we'll be talking about the classic parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapses. And um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this um, textbook model of cerebellar learning, but I'll take you through it and then map ocular motor learning onto this. So um, as you know, Purkinje cells are the sole output neurons of the cerebellar cortex. You can think of them as representing all of the different responses the cerebellar cortex might want to make. The parallel fibers carry very rich information about context. Um, they're getting input via the mothy fibers and granule cells um, about you know, coming from all over the brain. And, um, and then the other main input to the Purkinje cells is from the climbing fibers. Oh, so Purkinje cells represent responses. Parallel fibers represent the different contexts in which the cerebellum might want to make those responses. So by modifying the appropriate parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapses, the cerebellum could learn to make the right response to a given context. And uh, the plasticity at these synapses is under the control of the climbing fiber input to the cerebellum. Uh, if you record in vivo, the climbing fibers seem to encode errors. Um, sometimes they encode other things as well, um, but they, in many contexts, seem to encode errors. Um, and so the cerebellum is thought to induce this climbing fiber driven depression through these big, this big calcium influx, um, inducing associative long-term depression of the parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapses and thereby weaken synapses that uh, contribute to errors. Um, so that's the textbook model. Um, we, in, in our lab have been considering the extent to which this model can account for ocular motor learning. Um, and ocular motor learning, we're looking at smooth eye movements, changes in smooth eye movement responses. The goal, uh, so the Purkinje cells in the flocculus that controls ocular motor learning drive eye movements. Um, the goal of the eye movements is to stabilize images on the retina and the client, so if there's image motion that represents an ocular motor error. That error is encoded by the climbing fibers and, um, and that can weaken visual or vestibular parallel fiber synapses that caused a bad eye movement. Um, so that's the model. Um, we've been asking how much, you know, how much of the ocular motor learning can be accounted for by this. We think some of it can and some of it cannot. Um, in particular, in the first part of the talk, I'll be talking about the vestibulo-ocular reflex. So vestibular signals via the mossy fiber granule cell parallel fiber pathway um, provide vestibular signals to Purkinje cells. The Purkinje cells can drive an eye movement response. Um, so as shown here, if the vestibular stimulus that we deliver is rotation of the head about an earth vertical axis, so like a left-right head motion, that vestibular stimulus, so it goes left, right, left, right. This is the head velocity. The eye moves in the opposite direction, right, left, right, left. And then um, by pairing the vestibular stimulus with a visual stimulus we control, uh, we can induce a learned increase in the VOR. So if we pair 
the vestibular stimulus with oppositely directed image motion of an optokinetic drum. After about half an hour, we see a learned increase in the eye movement response to the vestibular stimulus alone. If instead we move the visual stimulus in the same direction as the head, then we can induce a learned decrease in the eye movement response to the vestibular stimulus. Um, so we can alter the amplitude of the eye movement response to a head rotation in either direction, an increase or a decrease. Um, and, and if you record from the climbing fibers, which I did when I was in Steve Lisberger's lab um, and compared responses during a bunch of different training conditions, uh, the climbing fibers encode errors during both kinds of training, training to increase the VOR and training to decrease the VOR. However, a number of lines of evidence suggests that this LTD, climbing fiber triggered LTD mechanism contributes selectively to VOR increased learning and not VOR decreased learning. And um, our first evidence for this came from when Ed Boyden was in the lab and he looked at these Cam Kinase 4 knockout mice that are deficient in the late phase of LTD. And he found a very selective deficit in VOR increased learning uh, with absolutely no deficit in VOR decreased learning. Um, and this uh, initial evidence from perturbation experiments um, has since been kind of, um, we've had other evidence from climbing fiber stimulation experiments. Um, there's work from other labs doing ex vivo uh, slices. So from Sung Jung Kim's lab, uh, making slices after training to increase the VOR. They found evidence for LTD. Uh, the student who did that work came to my lab, did the same thing for VOR decreased learning, found no evidence for LTD. Um, so a number of lines of evidence, I'm not going to show you all the data, suggest a very selective contribution to VOR increased learning of this classic LTD mechanism. And it's even more selective than that. Um, in Ed's work, he just simply change the frequency of the vestibular and visual stimuli that he's using to induce learning. And he found that if he went to a lower frequency, 0.5 Hertz, instead of turning the head back and forth at one Hertz and did the same kind of VR increased training, uh, the knockouts that were impaired in LTD showed perfectly good VR increased learning. Um, so we think that this, classic model, the LTD mechanism is very selectively recruited to support learning under certain kinds of training conditions and not others. And that there are other plasticity mechanisms within the cerebellum and related circuitry that are also contributing. It's part of the story, but not the whole story. Um, so, but we're gonna focus on when it's part of the story. Um, how does it actually function in the intact circuit? And we're especially going to focus on this difference between VOR increase and decrease learning. Um, although if you want to ask me questions about the low frequency, much of what I'll say about the VOR decrease learning also applies to VOR increased learning um, at low frequencies. So you know, there's a whole class of ocular motor learning tasks that we think don't depend on LTD. Okay, so I showed you the CAM Kinase 4 knockout um, results um, work from Yuzaki's lab uh, with photon saber, so an optogenetic inhibition of LTD. Um, they found also selective impairment of VOR increased learning and not VOR decreased learning. Um, they published this in 2018. We have the mice and uh, Amin Shakawat has replicated what they found. Uh, very selective when he does optogenetic inhibition of LTD, he sees very selective inhibition of VOR increase and not VOR decrease learning. Okay, so we wanted to use this selective contribution of LTD to ask a question about what happens when you enhance LTD. And um, we thought initially it would be nice to show that when you make a mutation or you do something to enhance LTD in the circuit that you would get very selective enhancement of the same kinds of learning that are impaired when you impair LTD. Um, so it was a really simple prediction. Carla Schatz had these um, MHC, uh, class one MHC, these are immune molecules that seem to put the brakes on plasticity if you knock them out. Um, you see enhanced associative LTP in the forebrain, and they saw enhanced LTD in the cerebellum. 
So um, she asked us if we wanted to look at these mice. We said, great. We thought we'd see enhanced VOR increased learning. And we saw exactly the opposite, a very selective impairment of VOR increased learning with no effect on VOR decreased learning. In other words, we saw the same learning deficit with an enhanced LTD uh, that we had seen and others had seen with impaired LTD. OK, so we were a little confused by that. Um, so recently, I mean, Chakawat, uh, well, we were confused. We put out some hypotheses in 2017. Um, and then recently, I mean, Chakawat has taken this up again uh, with another line of mice that has enhanced LTD. Um, this is uh, inspired by work published in 2005 by Chris Dezeu's lab. Um, they showed that knockout of the fragile X gene um, either globally or from Purkinje cells selectively with the L7 promoter resulted in enhanced LTD at the parallel fiber synapses. And uh, they had reported also at the time that there was impaired eye blink conditioning. Um, and also there's impaired eye blink conditioning in fragile X patients. Um, so we got interested in looking at VOR learning in these mice enhanced LTD, and again, we saw very selective impairment of VOR increased learning with no effect on VOR decreased learning. Okay, so um, again, kind of puzzling if LTD is the mechanism of VOR increased learning, why don't you get more of that when you enhance LTD? And um, we, we thought about some of the work that had been done like in around 2000 in the forebrain where um, there were various lines of mice with enhanced LTP. Um, and, you know, half the times learning was enhanced and about half the times learning was impaired. And nobody had ever really followed up to say why. There were some kind of hand wavy answers. So Amin wanted to use our circuit to really get at the why. And um, so there are a couple of possible models. So first in naive normal mice with normal threshold for LTD, you do training, you get LTD recruitment at particular synapses to give you VOR increased learning. Um, we, one hypothesis is that in mice with enhanced LTD, when you do the same kind of training, LTD is over recruited. You get it at synapses that shouldn't have undergone the LTD as well as those that should have. And so this over recruitment um, sort of corrupts the learning trace uh, so that you see impaired learning. You're LTDing the right synapses and the wrong synapses. So that's one model. Um, but we considered another model, which is that maybe in these mice with enhanced LTD, and enhanced um, means for these uh, fragile X mice, it means both that there's more LTD for a pairing protocol that induces LTD in wild type, and also that protocols that don't induce LTD in wild type can induce LTD in the knockout. So if there's kind of too much LTD, we thought maybe spontaneous activity in the circuit, just ongoing activity, um, might recruit LTD um, aberrantly, and that this recruitment of LTD might then increase the threshold for subsequent LTD so that um, it's less available when you come into the training uh, to be recruited at the right synapses to support learning. Um, so we have two hypotheses. One is that LTD is over-recruited. That's sort of the obvious one. Um, but we considered this opposite hypothesis that maybe LTD is under-recruited um, because of this ongoing recruitment making it less available. And these differ not just in whether during training you get too much or too little LTD, but they also differ in that the second hypothesis predicts that the problem with enhanced LTD occurs not during training, but before training. And this opened up the possibility that manipulations of the activity in the circuit before training might be able to alter this threshold. Uh, so Amin played around with this idea and um, actually, even before Amin, I wanted to show some um, initial evidence from our older paper in eLife. Uh, so we said, if the problem is that random recruitment of LTD can then make it not available to support VOR learning, uh, 
then if we artificially induce LTD in, in normal mice, wild type mice before training, and we did this by just stimulating the heck out of the climbing fibers while they sat there in the dark with their head stationary. So we just stimulated the climbing fibers to try to induce LTD any, in any randomly activated parallel fibers. And we asked, could we then induce LTD and increase its threshold and recapitulate this learning deficit? And we did. Uh, so the optogenetic stimulation itself did not alter the baseline VOR response. But then if we tried to induce learning, we did not see the normal VOR increased learning that we saw in mice um, where they got the light stimulation but didn't have the channel rhodopsin expressed. Um, so in wild type mice, induction of LTD did seem to have the effect of increasing the threshold or making LTD dependent learning somehow unavailable. Interestingly, we see a little hint that after 20 minutes, we did start to get some um, learning. So it might be that this kind of increase in threshold, if it exists, is um, temporary, like uh, lasting about tens of minutes. Um, so that's an interesting point we can come back to later if, if anyone wants to ask about that. Um, also interesting in these experiments was that VOR decreased learning was totally unaffected by this optogenetic stimulation of the climbing fibers before training. So that suggested that this treatment, pre-training manipulation, wasn't just messing up cerebellar learning because VOR decreased learning also depends on the cerebellar flocculus. Um, so that kind of flocculus dependent learning was intact. Um, it was specifically the kind of ocular motor learning that seems to depend on LTD that was perturbed. Okay, so now back to um, Amin's recent experiments. He asked, well, if we can take wild type mice and push them into this state where LTD is not available to support learning, can we do the opposite? Can we take the mice with enhanced LTD, which we hypothesize is creating this state where LTD is um, not available, and can we somehow reduce the threshold for LTD back to normal by manipulating activity in the circuit? And specifically, we thought it was spontaneous activity in the circuit that might be recruiting LTD when it shouldn't. Could we just lower the activity in the circuit, reduce the recruitment of LTD, and therefore um, reduce the threshold for LTD back to normal, make it available? And um, there is a drug widely used in humans, um, diazepam, Valium, uh, which is a GABA um, not agonist, a uh, allosteric agonist. So it, it sort of enhances GABA-A signaling and um, decreases activity throughout the brain. And so Amin just gave this diazepam systemically to decrease activity for a while to ask whether he could restore the capacity for LTD-dependent learning in mice with enhanced LTD. And, and he did this in the Purkinje cell-specific Fragile X knockout mice. So I showed you the bar graphs um, showing the learning impairment. Here's the whole time course. So 30 minutes of um, pairing of vestibular plus visual stimuli induces this nice uh, 25 or 30 percent increase in the VOR in wild type mice. In the in the Purkinje cell knockout of the fragile X, just no significant learning at all. So like complete impairment of that kind of learning. VOR decreased learning is intact in those mice. Uh, so now Amin gave a dose of diazepam to suppress activity. Um, and if he gave the diazepam and tested like immediately afterwards while the diazepam was on board, uh, all kinds of ocular motor learning were just like profoundly impaired, right? So suppressing activity impairs learning. That's not that surprising. Um, diazepam is pretty long lasting. So, I mean, then waited until the next day and retested VOR learning after this many hours of suppressed neural activity in the circuit. And um, impressively, the VOR increased learning was completely normal the day after diazepam. So no learning at all without this pretreatment. And then after diazepam, 
the, uh, the VOR increased learning was perfectly normal. Come back a week later and it's back to impaired. So there was a temporary restoration of the capacity for LTD dependent learning um, after this period of suppressed activity. Um, diazepam had no effect. So the, the effects were very specific. Diazepam had no effect on learning in the wild type mice and it had no effect on VOR decreased learning, which we think is um, less dependent or not dependent on the LTD. Um, we wanted to test another LTD dependent task and this work was done by an undergrad from Santa Clara University who's been working with Amin for the last year. Uh, so Natalia Cantu, she tested OKR adaptation, which is the kind of ocular motor learning that um, arguably has the most evidence for a key role of LTD. Uh, so OKR training, for OKR training, you just move the visual stimulus around the mouse. We move it at one hertz, back and forth, back and forth. The eye tracks it. And after an hour of training, the eye tracks it better. You have an increase in the gain of the eye movement response to the visual stimulus. Um, so Natalia and Amin did very similar experiments to what I described for VOR learning, gave either saline or diazepam, waited 18 or 24 hours, and then tested OKR training in the mice with um, Fragile X knocked out of the Purkinje cells. And um, what they saw with saline is that these mice are profoundly impaired on this other LTD dependent learning task. Wild type mice learn about 50% with an hour of training. The knockouts um, uh, I think are not even significantly learning at 60 minutes. Um, then tried giving diazepam and the learning is completely restored. So now we see on two different LTD dependent tasks that um, the mice with enhanced LTD do fine if there's been a quiet period, not a lot of activity um, in the circuit to recruit LTD before training, um, that seems to make the LTD dependent learning available. Okay, so these results are consistent with the hypothesis I described that when you enhance, like when you make the threshold too low, when you make it too easy to induce LTD, spontaneous activity in the circuit can recruit it just kind of with ongoing activity and thereby increase the threshold for further LTD. Uh, so there might be this kind of balance between making it easy enough, having your threshold set just right so that you can learn, um, but that you don't use that mechanism when you shouldn't. Um, because if you increase the threshold for LTD in response to your ongoing activity, then it's not available to support learning when you need it. Um, but if you can decrease spiking activity, you can um, restore the capacity. You can restore the LTD threshold and restore the capacity for LTD-dependent learning. Uh, so there seems to be a really dynamic regulation of the threshold for LTD-dependent learning um, that's controlled by spiking activity. Uh, so we call this threshold metaplasticity in contrast to the other kind of metaplasticity I'll show you next. Um, so this means that the amount of LTD-dependent learning or the availability is controlled both by the intrinsic properties of the synapses, the threshold you measure in a slice where the synapse is isolated from the circuit, as well as the recent history of activity and plasticity. There's this dynamic interplay between the properties of the plasticity mechanism and the history of activity in the circuit. Um, this idea was first proposed about 40 years ago by B.N. Stott, Cooper, and Monroe, the, the classic BCM sliding threshold model uh, for LTP. And a lot of the theory around uh, this idea of a sliding threshold has focused on synaptic potentiation, associative LTP. Um, so there's some really interesting implications thinking about it in terms of LTD, um, because for potentiation, uh, one of the um, one of the reasons that this model was proposed is this instability inherent in Hebbian plasticity, because if you if you potentiate a synapse, if, if correlated activity drives LTP and then the synapse is stronger, that will 
increase the correlated activity between pre and postsynaptic neuron. And so that will increase the probability of LTP. And you'll get this kind of um, positive feedback where potentiation leads to more potentiation. Um, and so the sliding threshold, one of the functions that's been proposed is to stabilize, to counter that instability and stabilize firing rates and synaptic weights. Um, but for LTD, associative LTD, there is no such inherent instability. Um, if you induce, if correlated activity induces LTD, and then that reduces the strength of the connection, there should be less correlated activity. Um, and so there's no instability like that. And for the parallel fiber synapse, it's even heterosynaptic. It's the climbing fiber, not the postsynaptic firing that's thought to control the plasticity. So we don't have the kind of instability um, that's been one of the main kind of um, ideas driving thinking about sliding thresholds. Um, but what this kind of sliding threshold for LTD could do is um, stabilize memory. So if you induce, if you put down, lay down a memory using LTD, um, you might want to reduce the the ease of inducing more LTD to stabilize that memory, prevent it from being overwritten, and also potentially to allocate memories acquired in succession to different Purkinje cell synapses. The, uh, the opposite idea has been proposed by um, Alcino Silva and Sheena Jocelyn, Denise Kai, and their colleagues in the amygdala, um, where they've suggested that induction of LTP for during fear conditioning can increase the excitability of neurons and therefore cause memories that are acquired in close succession to be allocated to the same synapses onto the same neurons. Um, here in the cerebellum, it may be working the opposite way that um, when you use LTD, then that this, those synapses may kind of reduce the ability to use LTD for more memories. And so the memory will be allocated to other synapses. Okay. So that's our thoughts about um, changes in the threshold for LTD. And now I want to, maybe we should take questions on both at the end so that I get through the second story, but I'll switch gears and talk about now a different kind of metaplasticity at the same synapses, temporal metaplasticity. So um, obviously it's long been known that time plays a key role in learning associations. And that's true both at the behavioral level and at the synaptic level as shown in this classic study by B and Pu, um, which showed that there were very precise um, timing contingencies that determined whether a synapse underwent long-term potentiation or depression. If the presynaptic neuron fired just before the postsynaptic neuron, they saw potentiation. If the postsynaptic neuron fired before the presynaptic neuron, they saw depression. And notably, um, changes in the timing of just a few tens of milliseconds determined whether the synapse potentiated or depressed. Um, so I was thinking about this work when I was in Steve Lisberger's lab. And um, uh, so let me just give you the punchline of this story before I go to that. Um, I'm gonna tell you about the timing rules for plasticity in the cerebellum at the parallel fiber synapses. And I'm gonna show you um, three things, evidence for heterogeneity in the timing rules for LTD across parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapses. I'll show you that in the ocular motor cerebellum, the timing rules are matched to the requirements of a specific task. And I'll show you that those timing requirements are also tuned through experience. So there seems to be temporal metaplasticity of the timing requirements for LTD. Okay, so I, I first started thinking about time um, when I was a postdoc in Steve Lisberger's lab um, because I described this classic model whereby the parallel fibers cause the Purkinje cell to fire when it shouldn't. And if that causes a behavioral error, the climbing fibers report that error. Um, but by definition, they report that error at a delay relative to the activation of the parallel fibers that cause the error. And um, for the eye movements that we study, these delays between Purkinje cell causes and the eye movement creates image motion that's reported by the climbing fibers. 
uh, that delay is quite long. I estimated it to be about 120 milliseconds in monkey. And um, we've since taken um, published data from Chris Dezay's lab during um, the OKR cross-frequency and estimated a very similar delay in mice. So um, this bothered me. This seemed like a pretty long delay compared to the tens of milliseconds that uh, were being re reported as necessary for controlling associative plasticity. Uh, so this got me thinking when I was a postdoc, how can delayed feedback induce plasticity in the synapses that caused the error? Because the feedback comes long after the synapses that caused the error were active. And one possible solution was suggested by some of the work that was being done in SLICE soon after. Um, here's work by Wade Regeer's lab, Safo and Regeer in 2008, showed that there was a pretty broad associative window for LTD of a couple of hundred milliseconds. Um, so they showed that they could get LTD if the climbing fiber was delayed by 50 milliseconds relative to the parallel fiber, uh, by 150 milliseconds, even if they fired the climbing fiber before the parallel fiber. Um, so there, there seemed to be uh, an associative window of a couple of hundred milliseconds that was effective at inducing the LTD. If they went longer, if they went outside of that window, they got non-associative LTP, which you get with parallel fiber activation alone. Um, but this broad window seemed to potentially provide a way to accommodate feedback delays of the sort that we had been seeing in the intact circuit during ocular motor learning. Um, but it, it, there was enough, it, you know, it just, it didn't quite sit right because one of the things we think of the cerebellum as, as doing is very temporally precise learning. And we know that even a weekend athlete can learn to time her finger release relative to her arm movement with a temporal precision of about 10 milliseconds. If the finger release is a little too early, the ball goes too high. If it's a bit late, it'll go too low. Um, so this is the kind of temporal precision we think about the cerebellum as doing, um, at least an order of magnitude greater than what was being reported at the synaptic level. Okay, so this puzzled me from the time I was a postdoc. Uh, so for like decades, I wondered about this. And then along came a very talented scientist, Aparna Suvrathan, who um, did a postdoc in my lab. She's now at McGill running her own lab. Um, and Aparna kind of resolved this discrepancy um, that I had been puzzled by for so many years. And she did so by measuring LTD in slices of the cerebellar loculus, which supports ocular motor learning. Before that, almost everything we knew, not exclusively, but almost all of the synaptic physiology on the parallel fiber synapses had come from slices of the vermis, because technically it's easier to keep your Purkinje cells in the right plane. Aparna made slices of the flocculus, and she found that the the rules governing LTD were quite different. Um, so first, she here's the experiment that uh, probably dozens of labs have done in slices from the cerebellar vermis. You pair parallel fiber and climbing fiber activation, coincident activation, 300 times, and Aparna got robust LTD in the vermis, just like many other labs have reported. But then she did the same experiment in slices from the flocculus, and she got the opposite. She did not get LTD. In fact, she got potentiation of the parallel fiber synapses. And again, that's what you get with parallel fiber stimulation alone. It was if the slices were not even seeing the climbing fiber stimulation here. So our first insight was that there was considerable regional variation in the rules governing plasticity at the parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapses, right? And these are such a well, uh, anatomically well-defined type of synapse, yet functionally the rules governing plasticity were quite different. Um, but we had at that point, a lot of evidence suggesting that LTD does contribute to ocular motor learning. So we thought these synapses in the flocculus should be capable of doing LTD. And we thought about this delay. So we tried playing, we meaning Aparna, tried playing into the slice, the pattern of parallel fiber activation 
followed 120 millisecond later by climbing fiber activation, which is what would happen in the intact circuit when there's an oculomotor error. And when she did that, then she got really robust, beautiful LTD in slices of the flocculus. So the functionally relevant delay between parallel fiber and climbing fiber activation could induce the LTD. We wondered how tuned the LTD might be to this delay in the circuit. And we were quite surprised at what we found. Parna only got LTD for 120 millisecond pairing interval, not for 100, not for 150. Only the feedback delay that we had measured in the intact circuit was effective at inducing LTD in the flocculus. So very tight tuning of the associative plasticity to the requirements of the circuit and the behavior. Well, that was pretty cool, but we, we had a hard time believing that the, the rules for plasticity in the flocculus would be precise and in the vermis would be not so precise. So Aparna then went back to slices of the vermis and, um, and was able to find precise timing requirements there as well. And she did this by looking at short-term plasticity induced by a single pairing of parallel fiber and climbing fiber activation. And that allowed her to test the same synapses with many different pairing intervals. And she found that um, some synapses onto some Purkinje cells were tuned to a coincident pairing, very little short-term depression for other pairing intervals. In other cells, the short-term depression was most effectively induced by 100 milliseconds or 120 or 150 um, with nothing at the other intervals. If you add the, if you just sort of average across all of these cells, uh, the short-term depression looks broadly tuned to pairing interval, just as had been reported for the long-term depression. Um, but this comes from averaging across a heterogeneous um, set of synapses. And to quantify this, we calculated a selectivity index and found that the selectivity for the pairing interval in the vermis was just as selective as in the flocculus. So after Aparna's work, here's where we stood. We knew that there were different timing requirements for LTD at the parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapses in different parts of the cerebellum and onto different Purkinje cells, even within a pretty small region like lobules five and six, where she did her work in the vermis. Um, and that by taking advantage of our extensive knowledge of signal processing in the oculomotor cerebellum, we were able to show this precise matching between the timing requirements for the associative LTD and the feedback delay in the circuit. And we hypothesized that the same kind of matching is true in other parts of the cerebellum, but that the climbing fibers carrying errors in different parts of the cerebellum will carry error signals of different modalities that could have different feedback delays. Um, so it, if the plasticity is tuned to that feedback delay, this would solve what theorists have called the temporal credit assignment problem, enabling the synapses responsible for the error to undergo the LTD selectively. Um, so we hypothesize, we're, we are trying to, we're, think, we're planning experiments to test this um, in other parts of the cerebellum, looking for this same kind of matching of timing rules at the synapses to feedback delay for climbing fibers to signal errors. Um, but in the meantime, a current postdoc asked the question, how does the synapse know what the relevant feedback delay is? How does the synapse know about the properties of the circuit and the behavioral system in which it's embedded? And um, like almost everything in biology, there's two possible answers, evolution or experience might tune the synapses to the properties of the circuit. I mean, uh, Sriram Jayabal um, bet on experience. Um, and I'll show you the results from those experiments. So he hypothesized that if it was experience that tuned this parallel fiber synapses to this feedback delay, then if we eliminate experience and the feedback of the climbing fibers in the flocculus is visual, so he can simply dark rear the animals. And if it was evolution that had tuned the 
the synapses in the flocculus to this interval, 120 millisecond pairing interval, um, then if it was evolution, we should still see that when we make slices in dark reared animals that have never experienced that feedback delay. Um, but he actually found a very big effect of experience as I'll show you. Um, so in these experiments that I'm gonna show you, uh, Sri Ram used spike count as the measure of plasticity. So he um, stimulates the parallel fibers, he measures the number of spikes in the Purkinje cell, and then he looks at changes in the number of spikes after pairing at different intervals. Um, he's gotten similar results by measuring uh, synaptic potentials as well, synaptic currents. Um, but I'm going to show you the results for spiking um, because it is a little closer to the behavior and it can be done in older animals as well. Um, so first, here's just Sri Ram's replication of um, what Aparna had found and published, which is that the um, parallel fiber elicited spiking is not altered by pairing parallel fiber and climbing fibers at um, a pairing interval of zero. Coincident pairing does not induce LTD of parallel fiber elicited spiking, um, but this 120 millisecond parallel fiber pairing, 120 millisecond interval between the parallel fibers and climbing fibers induces the robust LTD. Okay, so now the key question is what happens in the dark reared animals and um, in those animals, he found that this behaviorally relevant pairing interval was not at all effective at inducing LTD. So the ability of delayed climbing fiber activation to induce LTD is only acquired through experience of that delayed climbing fiber feedback that comes from uh, visual feedback in our circuit. In the absence of that experience, the synapses seem to default to a coincidence-based pairing rule, because in the dark-reared mice, coincident pairing of the parallel fibers and climbing fibers induced a nice LTD, uh, which we never see in normally reared mice. Okay, so um, experience dramatically alters the timing requirements for inducing plasticity at those synapses. We saw this both um, for long-term depression, and we also saw it for short-term associative depression, which is induced by just a single pairing of parallel fiber and climbing fiber activation, and then you test um, the response to the parallel fiber alone. This allowed Sriram to do a very fine-grained test of the tuning of the plasticity, the associative plasticity to the pairing interval. And like the long-term depression, he found uh, robust short-term depression for 120 milliseconds, not for other pairing intervals. But in the dark-reared animals, then a range of short pairing intervals were effective at inducing the, um, the associative depression. We saw, uh, well, we, we looked for a behavioral correlate of these altered timing rules. So what, what are the functional implications of using this uh, plasticity rule at the parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapses versus this rule that's very precisely tuned to the feedback delay in the circuit. And Amin uh, Sriram <laughs> looked for this with an undergrad in the lab, Jen DeSanto, who's now uh, doing a PhD at UCSF. And they looked at OKR adaptation. Uh, so I mentioned this in the first part of the talk, you provide a visual stimulus. So this is the velocity of the visual stimulus. Before training, the eye tracks the visual stimulus, but not very well um, in the normally reared mice. But with an hour of training, then um, the normally reared mouse learns to very closely match its eye movement response to the visual stimulus. And so then we can look at the learned component of the eye movement response by subtracting the eye movement we measure after an hour of training versus at the beginning of training and we can isolate this learned eye movement as shown here. Averaged across animals, 14 animals, we see a learned eye movement response that on average looks something like this, pretty well timed to the visual stimulus. And in fact, uh, the peak learned eye movement precedes, anticipates the visual stimulus by a few tens of milliseconds. So what about in the dark reared mice? So these are mice reared from birth in total darkness. They've never 
had the lights on. Uh, we bring them into the lab, we present an optokinetic stimulus, and they can track it. Um, and they can learn in an hour to make a bigger eye movement response. Um, but interestingly, the timing of the learned eye movements is not normal. Um, and specifically, the eye movements are delayed relative to the normally reared mice. And we can quantify this across animals. On average, the eye movements in the dark reared animals are delayed by about 100 milliseconds. And that's exactly what you would expect if when the climbing fiber reports an error, it's inducing LTD in the synapses active at that later time that the error gets reported versus the earlier time when the error was generated. So the normally reared mice seem to be compensating for that feedback delay and the dark reared mice do not. That was all in mice that were dark reared from birth. Um, currently, we have been looking at um, whether the timing rules for plasticity are continuously tuned uh, throughout adulthood. You can imagine it might be something that happened once during development, and then you use that plasticity rule for the rest of your life. Um, we asked whether it continues to be tuned later in life, and this is work Shuram did with Maxwell Kunga, another undergrad in the lab. Um, so here are the results you've seen already um, in normally reared mice. So they're normally reared for 60 days. Um, they have learned eye movements that are well-timed to the peak of the visual stimulus, which is shown here in the dotted line. And if you make slices, they undergo LTD for the 120 millisecond pairing interval, not for coincident pairing. Then after 60 days of normal rearing, they put the mice into the dark and there was a progressive decrease in the temporal accuracy of the learning until at 60 days, it was um, as delayed as we see in mice that are dark reared from birth. And at this point, Sri Ram made slices and he found that the, um, the timing rules for plasticity had completely reverted. So again, there seems to be a default to coincidence-based LTD um, and the relevant feedback delay was no longer effective in inducing the LTD. So even once these um, specific, you know, sort of um, tuned plasticity rules specific for the requirements of the circuit, once they're established, they need to be actively maintained or um, they kind of go back to this default coincidence-based rule. Um, they then put the mice back in normal housing and they um, the timing, the, the accuracy, temporal accuracy of their learning went back to normal and the timing rules observed at the synaptic level also went back to normal. Um, so there seems to be an active process throughout life of tuning the timing rules for plasticity. Um, so that's this third point. I told you the others, heterogeneity, heterogeneity across parallel fiber to Purkinje cell synapses in the timing rules governing long-term depression um, in the ocular motor cerebellum, it's matched to the requirements of the task um, in an experience-dependent way. So I will stop there and take questions on both um, threshold and temporal metaplasticity. I mentioned some of the key players. These are other people in my lab and collaborators who have worked on these projects. And um, here are many of the lab members experiencing multi-axis vestibular stimulation at the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk um, several months ago. And we also had a very nice experience of a human optokinetic drum that we enjoyed. Um, so let me turn off the slide so I can see you guys again, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Jen. That was just wonderful. Um, okay, so let's ask uh, some questions from Jennifer. If you can just raise your hand and uh, um, we, can, we can go to you and ask you questions. So I'll start. Um, diazepam, um, it was really fascinating, the results that you showed on the effects one day later. What do you think is the effect of diazepam on parallel fiber input, climbing fiber input, and maybe even the threshold of Purkinje cells? Um, yeah, so I mean, the expectation, uh, so 
it, it's potentiating inhibition throughout the entire brain, right? This is a systemic dose. We did not inject this into the cerebellum, um, in part because we're, you know, in large part because we're thinking about the therapeutic implications. Um, and so we expect suppression of activity everywhere. Um, of course, you know, it's hard to record granule cells, so it'll, it would be hard to do the experiment. Um, now that we've seen this, we can go back and do more kind of like, um, you know, less clinically relevant, but uh, more precise manipulations of climbing fiber or parallel fiber activity or both um, using, say, optogenetics or other tar more targeted techniques. But um, the expectation is that we're suppressing activities, so there's less, you know, less kind of random coincidence that can drive the LTD. Sounds good. Um, Solomon, you have your hand. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, you showed from the, the Safo and Reger paper that in principle, the LTD can be driven even with climbing fiber preceding the parallel fiber input. Do you think, I don't know if you looked at it, that via experience, experience it can get that, that climbing fiber preceding parallel fiber will also drive LTD? Yeah, that one is a little puzzling, um, but one thing that we've thought about um, in doing like and in, in some of the modeling with my uh, collaborator, Mark Goldman, is that, you know, I, I said that the parallel fiber causes an error and that you depress the parallel fibers that cause the error. But you can also think of the LTD um, as being the changes required at the parallel fibers to compensate for an error elsewhere. And so if the error was somewhere else, um, then you could imagine that the timing, you know, the timing wouldn't have to be the causal order at the parallel fiber to climbing fiber level, right? If it wasn't the parallel fibers that caused the error, but those are the ones that can correct the error, then maybe that backwards pairing would be the one that's needed. But yes, I, I, I that's kind of hand wavy. I, I do find it puzzling, yeah. Anders, please. Hi, thank you, uh, Jennifer. And thank Hi. you, Ray, for inviting me to this as well. Um, so Jennifer, do you think, um, could there be different timing rules for different synapses on a single Purkinje cell or, mm. or is it sort of cell specific? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, whether it's um, tuned in a synapse specific or cell wide property. Um, I think either is possible. And yeah, the short answer is we don't know, but I, I, I there are obviously different functional implications, um, but you can imagine that if the Purkinje cell is controlling a movement, at, at first I thought it should be cell-wide because I thought the, the timing that matters is Purkinje cell drives a movement or a behavior, and then you get feedback about that behavior, and that, that loop is shared by all the parallel fibers. So that's true. But suppose that that feedback delay depends on context, right? So say there's one context where the feedback comes at 120 milliseconds and there's a different context where the feedback comes more slowly. Um, in the eye movements, we actually, yeah, you know, we're, we're thinking about that because in, in low contrast, the feedback delay should be longer. So then if you have high contrast and low contrast, parallel fibers that are active selectively in one of those contexts, uh, then you could imagine different parallel fiber synapses would need to be tuned to different delays, Th that it would be advantageous. Um, whether the cells can do that, we don't know. And so but like that, that, those initial findings on temporal metaplasticity open up many, many questions. And one of them that we're quite interested in is that one. Is it cell-wide or is it synapse specific? Thank you. Wonderful. Um, are there any other questions for Jen? So I had one question. Um, you know, one of the really interesting results I thought was the difference between the diversity of uh, temporal learning rules between the flocculus and the vermis, whereas in the vermis you showed cells had a specificity for zero millisecond, 50 millisecond, 120 millisecond delay. In the flocculus, if I understood it correctly, it was all at 120. Right. So can you, what, what do you think, what, what is that about? <laughs> 
Yeah. So if there was ever a place where evolution could have done the job, it would seem to be in the flocculus, right? Because I had initially estimated that feedback delay in rhesus monkeys, and I had, you know, estimated it to be 122 milliseconds based on um, phase shifts across frequency, um, based on the the data from Chris Dezeu's lab on OKR, we got an estimate of 120 milliseconds fitting in the same way, right? So it looks very consistent. Um, so it should have been, you know, possible to predict. However, that's in like laboratory reared animals, which do not have a very great diversity of experience where in different contexts, there could be different delays. Um, and as I said, one of the things that can potentially change visual processing delays is contrast. Um, feral mice and monkeys would experience dawn and dusk. Lab animals do not experience dawn and dusk. The lights go on and it's bright and then they go off. Um, so we're interested in whether we give them a more naturalistic visual experience, then we might see a broader range of timing rules in the flocculus as well. And we're testing that right now. Hey. The experience dependent uh, changes were just fascinating. I'm, you know, in in um, uh, in the kinds of tasks that we do when we manipulate cursors on on screens and so forth, there are natural delays between the actions that we do and the visual feedback that we get. And I wonder if one were to train a person or let's say a mouse in um, some kind of task that there is a delay, um, whether the experience of that delay might produce a change in the plasticity rules that become specific to that delay. Right, exactly. Um, and when you do give delay, when you introduce delays, say in your system, the learning happens, but it's slower. Is that correct? Yes. Am I remembering yes. that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've also thought about this in the context of eye blink conditioning. So why do why does ocular motor learning happen with like you know a twenty five to fifty percent change in half an hour an hour of training, whereas eye blink conditioning takes days? Um, and you know we might speculate that. For eye blink conditioning, those arbitrary pairing intervals are the synapses haven't learned the learning rule for those pairing intervals, and that um, the metaplasticity has to first happen in order to do the the actual classical conditioning. So, um, you know, we we see the the tuning of the plasticity happens over weeks. Um, and so that that might be the rate limiting step for tasks where the synapses haven't first learned the timing rules. Um, so and then if I'm going to really wildly speculate, you know, this is the kind of thing that would be useful for other kinds of movements, right? If you're going to use your arm um, to do a sport like tennis, uh, one of the things you have to do is learn the right motor sequence. And the other thing you have to do is meta learn the feedback delays between you know from the somatosensory feedback from your arm um into the cerebellum so that you can learn more efficiently but once you've meta learned about the properties of the arm and the feedback delays then you can learn to do other things with your arm more rapidly right and that's the kind of meta learning the the sort of transfer to other uses of the same plant might benefit from first having tuned your synapses to those particular plasticity rules. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you for coming in early and um, doing this wonderful lecture for us today. Well, this is a really wonderful series, un unmatched uh, anywhere. And um, it's it's really awesome that you've put it together, Reza. So thank you. So much, Jennifer. Have a wonderful day. Bye, everyone.